Okay, sir. The live in five, four, three, two, one. So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this another uh, the grand finale of uh, worthy webinars from Voice. And it's my honor to introduce the conveners and the and also share the message from our IUA president. So I'll welcome Dr. Rishka Mehta. She is the convener for the worthy webinars from Voice. She's also the founder and chairperson of Voice currently, and the founder secretary of Waves, that is APUA Women and Education Center. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, we'll welcome our co convener, Dr. Jashna Rathor. He's a uh, fellowship trained pediatric orthopedic surgeon specializing in cerebral palsy and uh, pediatric orthopedic trauma. Uh, she has won numerous awards, and we welcome you, Jashna. Thanks for doing this with Ortho TV, and that's me and Neeraj. Uh, Dr. Shiv Shankar, our current IUA president, has sent us a message uh, for voice webinars, and I'd like to share this with all of you. My dear colleagues, it's a really honor for IOA and for me personally to host the Worthy Webinar Series by Voice. Voice is a acronym for Women Authors in India. Collective Empowerment, the subcommittee of IOA. To begin with this series, it is dedicated to the inspirational Dr. P.K. Mullah Piroz, who was the first woman orthopedic surgeon in India. She was an excellent surgeon, a great administrator and a brilliant teacher. All these are amazing qualities that women are naturally gifted with and we are happy at IOA to see more and more women orthopedic surgeons in India. Voice is doing a great service to orthopedic community by providing a platform to all the women orthopods to share their experience and expertise. The Worthy webinar series was unique in the sense that it involved both men and women as speakers and panelists. And this is a testimonial to the open-mindedness of voice office bearers. I must congratulate Dr. Rujuta Mehta and Dr. Chas Nal Rattod for conceptualizing and coordinating and executing this amazing series of webinar. I would also like to congratulate voice to collaborate with other similar associations like Apawa Waves and also to other international associations and create a platform to share the good work done by these societies. I would like to thank my IOA office bearers, especially Secretary Dr. Naveen Thakkar, President-elect Dr. Ramesh Sain, Vice President Dr. Atul Srivatsava for participating and supporting this webinar. I am unable to attend this webinar personally due to my various commitments. Today also I am sending this message sitting at Frankfurt airport. I extend my sincere thanks to all viewers who were in excess of 10,000 for the entire series till now. I am sure that these webinars have added value and knowledge to you and bring benefit in treating your patients better. Lastly, I would like to thank the coordinators of IOA TV and the Artho TV for wonderful webinar and the seamless technology and the support and in streaming these events live as well as making it available recorded. I also assure on behalf of IOA that Worthy series is just the beginning. Voice has much more to offer to the orthopedic community and we will definitely see more from voice in near future and also i welcome all of you to iocon 2021 at goa from 21st of december to 25th of december i must once again 
thank and congratulate the office bearers, the chairperson, Dr. Rajuta Mehta, Vidisha Kulkarni, the senior member and community awareness drive in charge, Dr. Neha Godgatte and Dr. Saraswati Vishwanathan, membership drive committee members. I once again thank Voice for having me here today, though virtually in this Voice webinar series. Thank you very much. So that was the message from our IO president and over to our convener for further proceedings. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ashok. I think this has been really momentous for us. And I am totally humbled and very, very happy to see so many of my respected seniors, so many of my dear friends, and so many of the future young, bright uh, women orthopods who are all uh, joining this stream. So, and international friends now. So I, I think there's a lot we can really do together collectively to both strengthen the uh, presence of women in a um, field which is thought challenging for them and also to work towards women's health. So without much ado, may I request our uh, young ne Neha to uh, do the introductions of our uh, respected chairpersons and speakers today. Uh, Chashnal, you are muted. Yeah, yeah, yes. Thank you. Uh, we could have the next slides. Yeah. 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 So very good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being with us over the past entire uh, weekends of October. And this is the grand finale worthy webinar, which is now coming to end. And today we have a very wonderful galaxy of speakers, I should say, and a, and a great... Um, chairpersons with us and I would like to introduce you to Dr. Emel Gonan. She is from uh, Coach University and she is associate professor at Coach University Istanbul. She is a pediatric ortho and trauma surgeon with the uh, Department of Ortho and Traumatology at the Coach University. She is both board certified with EBOT, TOTEC and Turkish Spine Society. She has been the national delegate for effort from 2015 to 19, and she has been executive board member for the Turkish Association of Orthopedics and Traumatology since 2013 onwards till 17, and also for the Turkish Ortho and Trauma Education Council and for the Turkish Pediatric Ortho Association, as we see during these different tenures. Currently, she is president for the Postgraduate Education Board of the Turkish Medical Association. She is vice editor for the Acta Orthopedica and Traumatology for the, uh, to the Turkish one, and the director of residence training program in Coach University. She's General Secretary of Ethical Committee of Turkish Association of Orthopedics and Traumatology and also an Executive Board Member for Crediting and Accreditation Committee for the Turkish uh, Medical Association. And uh, also she is a board examiner for the European Ortho and Trauma. So a uh, warm welcome to you, Emel Gonen, and we are very thankful to you for sharing this session with us today. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm honored to be here and uh, to be invited to this remarkable platform. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the second person we have sharing with us is Dr. Jamal Ashraf. And Jamal sir has been a mentor and a guide, and he's the one who has always supported voice. He introduced voice to APOA. Uh, APOA waves, in fact, and uh, thank you, sir, for being a well-wisher and supporter for voice. And of course, you don't need much of intro. You are a very well-known and renowned uh, trauma surgeon, or, and people know you even globally. And if I quickly take you through his intro, sir is Chief Surgeon and Director at the UM Trauma and Medical Center, Lucknow. He's widely traveled and has delivered various lectures in around 27 countries. He has been past president for the uh, Asia Pacific Trauma Society from 2013 to 16. He's past secretary general for 
APOS since 2016 till 2021. He's the second vice president of the APOA and he's AO Trauma for the India Council member. So thank you so much, sir, for being part of uh, voice webinars and we welcome you again for the grand finale webinar today. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Personal and thank you, Rujita. Although I'm filling in for a dear friend, Atul, but it's an enjoyable time and I'm sure I'm going to love it being here. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so Nea, I would request you to please introduce our speakers today. And thank you so much. Thank you, Chastan. Uh, I'm Dr. Neha Godagate. Uh, today, I'll be introducing uh, all our eminent speakers. The first speaker, all the speakers don't need much of introduction. But uh, our first speaker is Dr. Vrisha Madhuri. She is the Chief of Department of Pediatric Orthopedics and past Chief of Orthopedic Department at CMC Vellore. She is a past Secretary and past President of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. She, uh, she was a past editor of PORS Journal. She has uh, uh, received uh, many accolades, including National Research and Development Council, Government of India, for uh, societal innovation. She has multiple uh, national and international publications to her credit, pioneering her work in partial plate osteogenesis imperfecta, tumors, DDH, CTV bracing, uh, hip preservation, and deformity correction. She had uh, another global accolades of international surgery groups and widely traveled and fellowship trained in India and abroad. She's a pioneer in starting POSI fellowships and MCH courses. We welcome you, ma'am, Dr. Grisha Madhuri, ma'am. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Mandeep Dhilan. He is a professor and head of department of orthopedic surgery in PGI Chandigarh. He is head of department of uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation and consultant in charge. He's also uh, in charge of consultant at Sports Medicine Clinic at PGI Chandigarh. He's a former dean and physiotherapist of uh, sports medicine at Baba uh, Farid University. He was a pa past pa he's a pa he was a past president of IOA in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, sir also has uh, has been a chairperson to research AO uh, Trauma Asia Pacific Society. He is a past chairperson to AO Trauma India. He is a founder president of Indian Biologics Orthopedic Society. And he had been past president to many societies or associations, including Indian Arthroplasty Association, Indian Association of Sports Medicine, and Indian Asso Society of Foot and Ankle. He has been uh, editor uh, to Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery Asia Pacific, the Journal of uh, Postgraduate Medicine Education and Research. He is on the editorial board of Journal of Seaport and Journal of Isa Cost. He is right now an honorary consultant to various uh, sports authorities like Board of uh, Control of Cricket in India, Sports Authority of India, and Indian Hockey Federation and Gymnastics Federation of India. We welcome you, sir. Thank you so much for this introduction. Our uh, third speaker is Dr. Vidisha Kulkarni. She is uh, an associate professor and chief of head and upper limb surgery at Postgraduate Institute of Swastiyo Pratishthan, Neeraj, India. She has done all the air courses. She has published many papers nationally and internationally and also chapters in the textbooks. She's invited as a faculty member at various con conferences like TraumaCon in Mumbai, NailsCon, Master Course in Goa, uh, then Deformity Correction Course, MOACon, Wyrock, and state level, various state and international conferences. Uh, she, uh, she has also participated as faculty in national and international webinars. We welcome you, Vidisha, ma'am. Thank you, Neha. Now, uh, Risha, ma'am, will you share your slides, ma'am? Yeah. Naya, you have to stop sharing the screen. Mm -hmm. 
रिशा मैम योर या मैम नाउ वी कैन सी यू कैन सी Yes, ma'am. So we have to, but you need to share the slides. Your video is visible. Is it sharing now? No, ma'am. Not yet. No, ma'am. Not yet. In the meanwhile, Dr. Dhawal Desai, who's also been one of our uh, past uh, chairpersons for one of the trauma for uh, the webinars. He's just joined in as a panelist. Thank you, Dawal Bai. We welcome you. Uh, Mary Chasan, you can walk, Madam, through the buttons. Yes, ma'am. I think another screen has opened up, so I can't see the screen. So let me just add till Madam comes on that uh, uh, there are two topics very close to her heart. So Madam will take both those topics together. and i request the chairpersons to give her the questions at the end of the entire uh, length of the talks and dr dilan will follow after that and since he has a prior engagement once his question answers are over we may uh, you're on madam it's visible yeah yeah okay. so let's start madam yeah, thank you i'm sorry for that little glitch thank you rujita and uh, chasnal I think you have done a wonderful job of starting this new initiative, and thank you everyone for being present and facilitating this. Uh, so uh, there is a issue which I really have been following up for several decades now, more than a decade. Uh, can you hear me, ma'am? You have to do full screen, ma'am, from the slide sorter to the presenter view. Okay, this for me it is coming as full screen. The fourth icon, ma'am. down not yet full screen so this is the arrow screen is that it uh down on the left side ma'am you see there are four icons next to the slide magnification the one just next to 100% that one ma'am even on the top you can read presentation view and click on that Uh, on the top, ma'am. Ha, huh? if you screen sharing, okay, okay, I can get it now. What, which one should I press? Ah, uh, ma'am, on your PowerPoint down on the left, ma'am, full screen view, the fourth icon. You are on the second icon, ma'am, the fourth one. It says new share. No, 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 no ma'am. On the PPT, ma'am, on the PowerPoint. Okay. Not on the slide share or screen share, ma'am. On your PowerPoint, the fourth icon. Actually, nothing is coming up in the PowerPoint. I mean, uh, better if you click on the above. All there's the presentation views. Now, so after that, it. you will get an option. I think I've done it now. Not as yet. Is it okay now? Not as yet, ma'am. For me, it is coming as full screen. No, but it's not coming in the presenter mode. It's coming in as a slide sorter mode. Oh, I see. So that must be. Ma'am, you problem. can uh, stop sharing and share again. Possibly. You can try and share again. Now. You will have to share your screen again. You open your PowerPoint at the back and share your screen, and then click on the PowerPoint which you yeah. want to share. <coughs> okay, I'm on the PowerPoint, and, and then go to share the, screen. You will have to I'm share your screen. Share now. Is that okay? Uh, first, share screen, ma'am, from Zoom, and. then on the powerpoint ma'am i see now 
Are we getting it? We can no, see you, but we can't see your PowerPoint. I'm coming to Zoom again. Well, in the meanwhile, I think let's uh, just share a few uh, thoughts over here. I think what was uh, really happening with uh, so many different branches of uh, orthopedics now being opened that uh, there is absolutely no guidance into which who will uh, choose what branch. And somehow it tends to happen that uh, because it's a woman orthopod, they say that you must go in for hand or pediatrics. Of course, pediatric see, orthopedics is a very inspiring uh, field, but uh, I'm sure there are a lot of avenues. And with this, we've put in a mix of uh, speakers here in every worthy webinar. That's what we've tried to do. While Nisha Badam comes on, I think it's... Uh, um, Let's share so we got to go to the Zoom and share screen first. Yeah, that's yes, right. Yes. Now, and yes. Now, now presentation. The full screen icon. I can see. Show the fourth icon. Can you next. See? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Put it on the full screen. Uh, the next one, ma'am. Full screen, please. Oh, the one. Fourth I one. Know. The presentation slide. slide the presentation view. mode. Yeah, ma'am. Okay. That one. I'm so sorry. Okay. One more. So I think one of the two things that I've been working on quite in, intensively for the last few years is one is on the molecular diagnosis of various pediatric disorders and the other one is on the stem cell therapy for various pediatric disorders. And with osteogenesis imperfect, yes. both of these have come together. And so I'm going to present both the work that we are doing for the molecular diagnosis as well as how it led to the stem cell therapy for this condition. So as we know, osteogenesis imperfecta is pretty rare. And uh, in Western countries, what we see is that 90% of these are associated with COL1A1 and COL1A2 genes. And only 10% are transmitted recessively. And uh, uh, osteogenesis imperfecta for the, those who are postgraduate students is diagnosed when there is a susceptibility to fracture with trivial trauma. These children often have bony deformity, especially involving the long bones. And most of them will have uh, growth restrictions. And we still cannot see the PowerPoint individual slides. Is the slide from software that is open? One, one option is you press Alt and F5. Alt. On your keyboard, ma'am, Alt and F5 together. Okay, I've done it. Together, ma'am, Alt and F5 at one go. I'm doing it, but it is showing me the screen, so I can see it there. Well, in the screen, if you press on the slide, big slide, what you've got is the four slides icon at the bottom of your screen, if you look at it, or on the top of it, you can go to a normal or a PowerPoint view, and then you'll be able to see. There's a presenter view. Right at the bottom of your screen, there should be one which says slideshow. Yes, yeah, ma'am. That's okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You yes. got it now. So in, in India itself, we have almost the one third of the world's OI patients. That is about 1.5 lakhs. Total number in the whole world is about 500,000, 5 lakhs. So um, the bone structure itself is quite hierarchical. So you have these amino acids which go on to form the collagen chains. Three of these call, call, uh, call one and call one A1 and A2 chains go on to form the tropocollagen. These form the collagen fibrils. These fibrils are arranged in an order and then... Is there some problem again? Because this thing is coming again. Okay. Oh my it seems to be working. So, uh, basically, the collagen uh, uh, formation, uh, during its formation, in different ways, you can have uh, uh, problems with the collagen synthesis and structure. You can have problem in the post-translational modifications once the collagen fibers are secreted out of the cells. And then you can have problems with the collagen processes and cross-linking. And each one of these steps are controlled by different genes and deficiency of these genes can cause uh, problem with the uh, collagen formation. So these genes mainly affect the collagen formation as such. But there are a number of other genes which also affect the bone mineralization in osteogenesis and imperfecta. One of them is the like DIL protein, which is affected in the IF-ITM5. 
of PEDF secretion, which is affected in certain F1 gene, or uh, other parts like formation of osteoblast and mineralization after the osteoblast formation by Wnt1 and other others, uh, other um, uh, genes which affect the osteoblast differentiation and its functioning. So all of these uh, defects can lead to uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. So clinical osteogenesis imperfect uh, classification has five types. So the OI type, this OI type one is almost normal stature, few fractures, usually no deformity. OI type two is perinatally lethal and is hardly ever seen by the orthopedic surgeon. The progressively deforming severe types is the most common seen by us. Many of these patients are wheelchair bound. In our country, many of them have recessive transmission and they are the ones who require most of the surgeries. And the variable type of OI with normal sclerae or light blue sclerae, these are the moderate forms of OI with different kinds of presentation. They can be slightly more severe or they can be milder. Type 5 is a class by itself where you can actually diagnose based entirely on the clinical criteria. Here you have a hyperplastic callus, but the radial head dislocation and the interosseous membrane calcification are very classical and easily put up, is easily identified. So OI type 1 is entirely by call 1A1A2, perinatally lethal, there are few recessive forms of OI also which cause it. But in the type 3, you have a large number of genes, both call 1A1A2 as well as large number of recessive genes which cause this. And again, the variable OI has also some genes which cause it and OI type 5 is caused only by the IFITM5 gene uh, modification. There are 20 numbered genes as well as 8 other genes which cause osteoporosis leading to multiple fractures. And these are all have been classified and, and studied. So uh, the cure for OI, again, I thought I would just include this for the sake of the students, is mainly medical right now. The therapeutic approaches for OI are usually borrowed from the treatment of osteoporosis. So you need both anti-desorptive and anabolic therapy. So they are commonly used um, uh, treatment is the bisphosphonates. And the one commonly used in our country is the cyclical intravenous pyrimidronate. In the Europe, neoridronate is more common. And in many parts of our country where pyrimidronate is not, not available, zolidronate is also used. Pyrimidronate has been shown to improve clin clinical outcomes considerably. And in the, uh, as you can see in the lateral radiographs, you can also see it increases the height of the vertebrae. It increases the bone density, as you can see in the other picture. They also, uh, in some forms of OI, like uh, uh, IFITM5 type 5 OI or Serpin F1 OI, the pamidronates are not supposed to work very well because it, the mechanism of action at which it should work is different. And these are mainly mineralization disorder. And there, the denosumab has been found to be more effective. So assessment of pamidronate therapy is usually done by uh, looking at the radiographs. One is you can see the multiple zebra lines, which suggests to you how many dosages have been taken and also increase in sclerosis on the X-ray. But much more important is to do the DEXA scan every six to two months. The uh, low bone mass or density is described as, uh, is as equal to minus two standard deviation. So usually you need the Z scores and it can't be used in children less than three years because they're BMD changes by uh, are very high per year till they reach the age of about four. So it's not possible to use this as a parameter in these patients. Also, there's hardly any uh, normative data for children under four. So we did a study on the molecular genetic analysis in Indian children. We screened 180 probands and we found 180, 158 which were positive, out of which autosomal dominant uh, OI, that is predominantly basically called 1A1 and A2, was in 90 and the recessive forms were seen in 68. So here, as you can see, 62% were type 3 OI, 11% uh, were uh, type 1 OI, and the remaining form the rest. Uh, based on this, uh, we had blue sclera in 95 probands, the dentogenesis imperfecta in 42, and joint contractures were seen not just in the uh, Brux syndrome, but they were seen in other forms of OI as well. So looking at the genetic uh, landscape of this, you can see that the call one A1 and A2 are up almost 60%, as uh, unlike the European population where it is almost 90%, and the very rare forms are seen, and the common ones in our country, the recessive forms are serpent F1, uh, one wind, as well as leprae. These seem to be 
forming a large number and all are very severe OIs. Uh, looking at the novel variants, there are 56 novel variants in this population that we study. And most of the severe ones had the missense kind of mutation as expected. So looking at some of the phenotypes, uh, spectrum of the collagen gene mutation of the 84 probands in the collagen gene mutation that we had, the age ranged from three to 27 year olds. And based on the Cillins classification, they were about one third type one, one third type three, and about one third type four. Uh, blue sclera was seen in a uh, majority of them and dentogenesis imperfecta was seen in almost half of them. Almost all of these patients had undergone intramedullary nailing for the lower limb if they were slightly older. Some children were younger also. Most of them required intramedullary nailing. They are the ones who responded very well to the pamidronate, usually with decreased fracture rate, increase in bone mineral density, and increase in the mobility of the patient. The IFITM5, we had only five um, probands, and these showed the classical symptoms of hyperplastic callus, enterosis membrane ossification as well as radial head dislocation. So really, this particular group doesn't require a genetic identification. Then coming to the serpin F1 gene, which is actually uh, was quite common in our population, we found that we have a little hot spot near Trichy here in India. And um, they have had no blue, blue sclera or DI. And they were actually a little unusual because they don't, they're not just osteoporosis, they also have osteomalacia. And they are little late starters. So they're ideally, you won't see them till about two, three years exhibiting any symptoms. And after that, the fracture intensity starts increasing. And they, though they respond in terms of bone mineral density, their mobility and deformities don't increase very much. And as time progresses, they tend to become worse and worse. So you can see here, you don't not only have osteoporosis in the X-ray, but you can also see the red protrusia, suggesting that you have a uh, osteo osteomalacia as well. And uh, of course, the deformities and the classical popcorn classification are seen there. In the Wnt1 gene type, we had 12 of these. There's a classical symptom that is seen here, that is the ptosis. If you see an OI child with ptosis, suspect the Wnt1 type. Again, here, there is a very severe uh, osteoporosis, severe spine involvement, and both upper and lower limbs are involved here. In the um, uh, P3H1, this is usually considered the lepre one, is considered the perinatal severe to lethal variety, but we had a large number of surviving patients in this. They also had rhizomelia, and they had, most of them were requiring both upper and lower limb uh, uh, IM rodding, and their mobility was mainly wheelchair in majority of, the, almost two thirds of them were in wheelchair. So coming to the FKBP10, this is the one which is known to have club foot and, uh, uh, joint contractures along with the along with the uh, uh, tendency for increased fracturing. They also have kyphoscoliosis as they grow old. And this uh, this particular type was unusual in the sense that usually you say joint contractures, you ex except, expect it all to be FKBP10, but we have collagen abnormality patients also who had joint contractures. Some of the joint contractures can also be seen in another uh, uh, type of uh, genetic mutation, which is called the PLOT2. So that also is something else. So having done this study, and this is actually finished now, we are now continuing with this using, creating these genetic mutations in an HS5, say, mesenchymal stem cell line. And in this cell line, which has a tendency to be osteoblastic, and in this cell line, we are actually introducing these genetic mutations to see the effect of drugs, because large number of these mutations are novel for us. So we actually need to know which are the types which will respond to which drugs. And some of the drugs that we are screening are already commonly used, and some are novel drugs that we have uh, hypothesized based on our experience in osteoblast osteoblastic uh, differentiation that we've been doing in our lab for many years. So another way we are looking at is, besides introducing these genes, is to actually take patient samples, isolate the cells from that, and then again test them for the drugs the common ones like pamidronate, dinosumab, and teriparatide, as well as novel ones. So just a little note on the surgical uh, management. Because they have deformity, they tend to get fractures repeatedly, and they have, of course, uh, uh, cannot walk also. So uh, the issue arises is, should we do prophylactic nailing on them, and what is the ideal age? So usually, there is no prophylactic nailing as such, but when you have recurring fracture, even one or two bones, then you tend to do prophylactic nailing for the others. And as to how soon you can nail it is as soon as 
you can and the, the timing is limited more by the diameter of our intramedullary devices rather than just cage. Intramedullary device is preferred always rush rods or telescoping rods or double rush rods and they are the Important thing is to limit the immobilization after surgery to not more than three to four weeks because they lose nearly 30% of their bone mass while waiting uh, and for to be uh, while waiting after surgery to be mobilized again. So it's important to not immobilize these patients after surgery. So the main principle for the surgery is that you should get a mechanical anatomical axis for your IM implant. If you don't do that, then the chances are that the nail will cut out and you will have to revise it much faster. So coming to the uh, main, uh, the important part, that is the how to boost these brittle bones besides doing the surgery and the uh, uh, drugs is uh, the, uh, the work that has been going on in cell therapy. This was first reported that as a byproduct that bone marrow MSCs decrease the fake fracture frequency, increase the total bone mineral content and cause new dense bone formation. This was then tried out by Horowitz uh, in uh, subsequently in six OI patients and then was found to be effective in short term. We found good effect only for six months. So goitestrom actually tried out fetal liver derived MSC by delivering these cells in the intrauterine uh, uh, phase of the, uh, and for, of, the, of the OI patient. She was able to deliver it before the lungs expanded and most of the, so the most of the cells would not be lost. And also the cells were delivered before the child could start getting multiple fractures. So this had shown in few cases, about three cases published, good results. And based on that, they were, there was a trial started in the West, which is called Boost Before. And simultaneously working with the same team in Karolinska, Dr. Goethe Strom, we started a clinical trial, trial called Boost to Be. And the Boost to Be is our clinical trial, which is going to uh, deliver these uh, MSCs, fetal liver derived MSCs, intravenous and intraosseous. Intraosseous is to avoid the lung filtration that happens with all the MSC therapies. And of course, we are, have the historical and untreated prospective controls. And the, uh, the, the cells will be are mismatched. They are not matched, actually matched to the patient. And we were, because we know that there is a transient effect, so they, each patient gets multiple doses, four doses at four months interval. So, uh, so our boost to brittle bones uh, uh, trial was then based on a previous experience of improved linear growth, mobility, and decreased fracture incidence of Goethe-Strom's previous work. So we have obtained uh, we have obtained all the necessary clearances, of course, as we need to do so in this country, and with uh, a clearance from the Drug Controller General for uh, registration in CTI RI the IRB and uh, stem cell apex committee of the country. So why these cells, fetal liver derived MSCs are better than other cells because they're more oxygenic than adult MSCs, have more number of duplications. So if they do transplant, they will tend to last longer. They cause less immune response and they have been shown to actually engraft nine years after the booster dose. So they also been shown to cause higher mineralization in the micro CT and higher uh, uh, bone formation on the micro CT. So uh, our trial consisted of four doses of allogenic human fetal liver derived MSCs given every four months. And it was is meant to be for, for 15 children between the ages of one to four years. And uh, the dose is, uh, is 3.2 into 10 days to six per, uh, per kilogram per long bone, as well as one uh, uh, per kilogram IV and one into 10 days to six viable cells per kilogram per long bone for uh, intraosseous delivery. Four infusion, finishing within a period of 12 months. And the pri primary endpoints, of course, were safety and frequency of treatment-related uh, adverse events. And secondly uh, was the efficacy. So we addressed several issues, uh, which with, when we compared with the boost uh, before, which is the European trial, and they use prenatal MSC. We had know that our patients will not accept this because uh, also it is difficult for us to get the prenatal diagnosed patients to come because if they are diagnosed, uh, most of the patients will undergo termination. So at the here we have, so we made it one to four for ease of identifying these patients. Then when they, the, since the effect is uh, transient, we made every four months, we increase the dosages four times to every four months so that the effect will be longer lasting.
And because the low level of MSC engraftment has been noticed in bone in previous clinical study, we decided to do intraosseous injections into all the weight bearing long bones. So the methodology, we imported these cells, we checked the viability, cell count, reconstitution, uh, and also the potential, the potency of these cells by checking them whether they are able to create that much bone in vitro. Then we monitored the vital signs and other the features for the post-operatively to see if there was any adverse event related to transfusion, infusion. And then at 16 min months, we also needed to do total bone mineral density. And there are a whole lot of other small, small criteria, which I will come to later. So the analysis showed basically that whatever were the findings on these cells in KI were the same as what were the, the, was the results when we tested them at CMC. So they did not lose their potency. So I'm going to talk about the first patient because this is the only one which has completed all the four injections and has completed the four month waiting period. So this child had a first fracture at one and a half months, gets two fractures a year, has a very severe abnormality, which is the one which we are choosing the, all the patients only with this glycine substitution abnormality in call one uh, gene. And there is, uh, uh, and the total number of fractures every year for him is two. So the donor was a female with a totally mismatched HLA or zero out of 12. And, uh, <coughs> and there were presence of donor specific antibodies of uncertain positivity in the patient. So this is the uh, injection into all four uh, weight-bearing bones. And then we assess the safety and tolerance. And we found that there was absolutely no adverse event for this patient. And two subsequent patients who have gone under, already are undergoing multiple doses have also tolerated the injection with no SAE so far. So the baseline donor-mediated immune response, we noted interestingly that as each infusion went on, actually the, there was a de decline in the pre-existing antibodies to the donor HLA till our last infusion showed no antibody bodies uh, to the uh, no no ex antibodies to the donor HLA. Um, fracture frequency reduced from two per year to one year. We had one fracture at the age of eight months. This child who was actually previously not but just walking with difficulty was running and playing like a normal child and developed a toddler's fracture. That was the only injury that he had. Uh, his clinical status of, of OI, his development quotient in, increased. He started speaking, he wasn't speaking before. And his biochemical bone turnover also showed improvement. So the bone mineral density increased in all the um, uh, lumbar spine and in the forearm and the total bone mineral density. Height, which, went, which was less than 5th percentile, went up to about 10th percentile, an increase in, of 11%. Weight, which was between 25th to 50th percentile, went to about 50th percentile. Uh, his quality of life improved considerably. Physical functioning score reached up to 100. And the same way, the port C score, the functional score, went from 75 to 92 for upper extremity and globally from 60 to 93. And uh, so uh, we are continuing with this um, uh, recruitment as well as transplant of, for this osteogenesis imperfecta of a particular type, that is the Coleman abnormalities. And side by side, we have also started looking at how to isolate, characterize, and manufacture these cells. And this has been going on in five batches of, have been produced and characterized already and shown to be highly, highly osteogenic. So I think uh, boost to be will finally, at the end of its uh, study period, will evaluate whether the fetal liver derived MSC work in the clinical trial setting. And if they work in the clinical trial setting, we will probably form a new treatment for OI. And that is a, one of the reasons why we are looking at all the different types of OI and checking for their uh, the efficacy of the cells in vitro against each one of those types of OI. So take home for the students here is mainstay in OI is still the medical management, surgical internal sprinting and with intramedullary double rod or elongating rods when required and watch out for the stem cell therapy clinical trials. Maybe something will work out which will make it uh, redundant for us to do the uh, surgery, surgery completely. So I will just go uh, very shortly and talk about the march of the tin soldiers. This was done at the request of the tin soldiers um, group. They are a group in South Africa who are an FOP group uh, and they are patient groups. So that is done by the patients and the families. So I just want to bring to your attention this three-year-old boy who had a swelling over the nape of neck, heart consistency, fixed to underline bone and restricted neck movement, underwent a biopsy after finding some gadolinium enhancement in the form of T2-weighted and star hyperintensity in the muscle. Biopsy was done and then he underwent a second biopsy 
from the lumbar region uh, because and after the second biopsy the lesion started increasing in size developed warmth and became inflamed and then they started making a search for the cause because the biopsy just says some fibrosis lesion and doesn't really give anything more information than that so then they did a survey of the uh, other bones found a mass in the neck can you see the fibrous band that is uh, highlighted there and this is attached to the spinous processes and progressing along the posterior muscles. What everybody had not been looking at is the child's foot, which actually shows short toes with hallux valgus. And this should actually have, should have put them on the right path. There's also, this child also had a restricted elbow movement. By this time, it is already, we have lost a lot of time uh, when we could have prevented the deformities. And by doing surgeries, we have added to the deformities. So this child, we had done a genetic analysis and we confirmed the diagnosis of FOP. And uh, if you can see this R0, R206H in the ACVR1 gene is the classical genetic mutation. And almost all the patients, more than 90% of the patient have this mutation. So it's not a very expensive or difficult uh, search to do. Biopsy is contraindicated in FOP and clinical examination, especially looking at the typical foot lesion is the key to the diagnosis. We have differential diagnosis for this, osteosarcomas. Uh, FOP and uh, uh, the POH and the myositis or ossificans traumatica. These all these form a differential diagnosis. So uh, what is FOP? For those of you who are not aware of it, I think it's important to just know because once in a lifetime, pediatric orthopedic surgeons definitely and the most other orthopedic surgeons will also probably see, see this lesion sometime in their life. And if they don't miss it by just looking at the foot of the patient, that would be great because it will actually improve the quality of the life of the child a lot if we didn't worsen the condition. It's very rare and something like one in two million population. And the classical change is the, is the malformation of the grade twos. And it leads to progressive disabling heterotopic ossification going from cranial to caudal. So that finally it locks the person in a second skeleton, which stops joint movement, makes it difficult to open them out and affects the breathing of the patient. So India should have, based on the calculation, should have about 1,500 patients. However, only less than 100 have a known diagnosis. So most of these patients are actually under, do undergo multiple surgeries to either remove the, to have biopsy of the lesions or to remove the lesions. And many a times to actually create uh, to, by us, orthopedic surgeon by removing the new bone causing joint, restric joint restriction with disastrous results. So how to diagnose? Look for the short and valgus grade two deformity always. Bony swelling, single or multiple should uh, make us look for these things. And uh, fibrous bands uh, or bands across the joint, again, that is important. Bands across the joint or fibrous bands across the muscles also. And if you see a child so young that you don't see any of the other condition, but just see the grade two deformity, then a genetic, genetic analysis of the ACFPR gene, one gene mutation would be ideal. And by doing that, you could actually avoid a lot of uh, problems. So again, to hypothesize, if, if you're going to do any kind of a cutting and poking on a child, please, please, please look at the toes. That is so very important because the surgery can lead to quite disastrous results in these patients. So what are the do's and don'ts? These, all these children should re receive vaccine, but they should receive it subcutaneously. They should, uh, we, we can treat all um, uh, inflammation, uh, in fevers and other inflammatory disorders should be treated promptly. Any blood co collection, if it is required, should be all done at the same time, because we have seen in the site of any puncture because of multiple pokes, patients have developed nodules even in those places. Avoid biopsies, avoid surgery except for life-saving surgery. And if you're doing the life-saving surgeries, they have to be covered with steroids. Avoid physiotherapy, any kind of trauma and multiple punctures. There are drugs available for the management of these patients, usually Montelukas, Celecoxib, uh, from the uh, major, uh, most of the time in the chronic uh, period. But if you have an acute lesion, which is likely to restrict the, a joint, any kind of a joint motion or the jaw, then you have to give high-dose steroids. Um, sometimes even after you give high-dose steroids for five days or even sometimes longer, you find that the lesion is not quickly resolving. In that case, the intravenous pamidronate can also be tried. There are many drugs under investigations and I've listed a few. Palovertine is now, I think, going in the phase three trial. 
is active in the uh, antibody, ACVR anti antibody and other uh, similar drugs which are on trial. So uh, I just close with this patient who just came about a few weeks ago. This child had, at the age of about 11 years, had developed a, uh, injury in the, uh, had an injury to the wrist and developed at the same time a myositis of the elbow. So this was operated, and this was not just operated once. This child went on to have 13 operations subsequently for different uh, lesions which were coming on. So different joint restrictions, and the surgeons kept on operating. And as you can see, this child actually has the, uh, the toe deformity. So even, even though the diagnosis of OP was made, uh, it was still, the surgeries were still done. And that is the reason why I am bringing this message to this forum, because as orthopedic surgeons and pediatric orthopedic surgeons, you're only second to the rheumatologist who will see this condition in your life. And I'm sure each one of you will definitely see this condition in your life. So please, please look at the toes. So this is the state of this child now. He's totally fused. And right now, even at a very young age of some, I think he's 23 or 24, he already has actually, his lung capacity is compromised and he has difficulty in breathing just making his life shorter than it should have been. So the Tin Soldiers is actually an organization of family members and patients with FOP who are searching for other patients with FOP because they want to actually make contact with them, tell them what is possible, help them with the treatment. Sometimes they are helped with resources as well. And therefore I'm putting out the, at their request, I'm putting out the, their message. So from India, one of the parents of the FOP child, Sunil at fopindia.org, they can contact or the doctors can contact and uh, put the child in um, uh, contact with uh, FOP professionals as well as with the FOP groups or they can contact the international group which is based I think in South Africa uh, at info at tinsoldiers.org. I have not put their phone number so I think I would leave with this. I have that next slide is on the thank you slide. I'll leave with this so that if this is of any use people can use it and thank you very much and thank you for letting me take so much of such a big chunk of your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Madhuri. Uh, that was a fabulous presentation. Uh, it was enlightening very much. Thank you. Um, I would ask about FOP. Uh, you, you mentioned about the biopsies and uh, vaccinations that should be avoided. And uh, in order not no, not vaccinations. Vaccinations can be given. Intramuscular vaccinations. Yes. You said. Yeah. So in order to not, in order not to trigger the uh, ossification again, uh, would you uh, think that there is a place for physiotherapy? To what extent we can use physiotherapy uh, modalities? And what about the COVID vaccines uh, nowadays for uh, in order not to trigger ossification? Okay, so currently, um, I think uh, uh, physiotherapy as such is not advised, though mobility exercises can be carried out, but anything which where you cause muscle strengthening and you can cause muscle damage, then it might lead to an inflammation and that might lead to an ossification. So in general, they avoid physiotherapy. That's one thing. Secondly, COVID vaccination as yet, no. But what they are looking forward to is maybe that when they have the nasal vaccine available, then that can be taken. So, so far they have not yet advised to take COVID vaccination. Thank you. But I just, just to give you a little uh, feedback that I received from one of the patient today, a whole family of, of um, developed FOP, including the FOP child, I mean, developed uh, COVID, including the FOP child and both the parents. So the child didn't actually have anything. She had two days of fever and she recovered and did not develop. So I'm assuming that the reaction to COVID was no different in the FOP child than it would have been to any other, for any other child. Yes. Thank you. And for osteogenes imperfecta, uh, would you recommend any protect, protection such as exoskeleton to use uh, of exoskeletons? So I think uh, I didn't uh, go into that because uh, the lect lecture was more focused on the research part of it. Yes, but from the time the child is born and if you when, as soon as you diagnose the FOP, there are several different kind of uh, braces and other things which I advise. These are usually soft 
um, like they, you know, in Sweden, uh, they put little soft uh, pads of uh, foam kind of thing in their uh, uh, diapers, under their diapers and inside their pants so that even if they fall, they don't hurt themselves. And uh, they provide soft splints for the segments when the child starts to stand and walk. But I think there is no exoskeleton as such that you want to give because you will actually decrease the bone mineral density. They already have a bone mineral density which is lacking and the immobilization actually makes everything worse. So most, most of them don't even recognize, I mean, don't even uh, recommend any immobilization greater than three weeks for fractures. Ma'am, you can stop sharing the slides. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, and uh, Mandeep, sir, you uh, please share your screen. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That was a thank great you. talk. I mean, it was a eye opener for me because I probably hadn't heard of many of the things which uh, Doc has talked about. And my talk is rather more down to earth. Uh, if you want, should I start my talk? Yes, sir, please. Sir. Okay. Well, I'll be talking about fractures of the calcaneus. And if you can see over here, I, I'm author of the AO of Trauma Foot and Ankle Manual also, indicating my interest in calcaneus fractures. So what has been my journey in understanding calcaneus fractures? Well, it started when I was 12 years old and I was diagnosed with Sievers disease. And Dr. Hardar Singh from Amritsar put me into a bilateral plaster for my heel pain and I lay down in bed and just read and read. Till now, when I started understanding how we should actually manage calcaneous fractures. I've done a monograph, but we'll go on beyond this. First point about calcaneous fractures is they are common. More than half the tarsal bones are calcaneous fractures. So most orthopedic surgeons have to deal with them. The second point is that they are of many types. You could see peripheral fractures, you could see central fractures, you could see crushed bones. Any type of fracture can happen in the calcaneus. And the third point, which I now have learned, is that the management differs. It differs according to the site of fracture, according to the degree of displacement or comminution, according to the patient profile, old, young, fat, diabetic, and according to the surgeon profile, whether you know what you're doing or you're just a resident in training. So let's talk about the various types of calcaneous fractures. You know, most of us talk about the displaced intra-articular fractures, which are definitely much more common. But we often forget the tuberosity fracture, the sustentaculum fracture, the anterior end of calcaneus fracture, which if not managed properly, could lead to more disabling symptoms than a simple, badly managed intra-articular diaphyseal fracture. Now, look at this case, twisting trauma in a young male, but he was unable to bear weight. So these x-rays were not so clear and he was put in a plaster saying that you don't have seem to have anything much. But when additional investigations like CT scans were done, they showed a displaced sustenticulum fracture along with a lateral process of the talus fracture. So it's an intra-articular injury of two bones which form the subtalar joint, therefore demands attention. So what is done for this was that you need to go both laterally and medially. You cannot put this in a plaster and let it be. The guy is going to have a varus heel and pain both on the medial and lateral sides of the subtalar joint. So according to the manual, there's a chapter dealing on to this. So what we did also, we did a medial approach to the calcaneus, fixed the sustentaculum talus by two screws and through a lateral sinus tarsi approach, we fixed the talus. And now you've got a well reconstituted subtalar joint with gradually increasing function, which comes back to normal over, over a period of time. And you can see that this guy has got a decent walk, no subtalar arthritis, and he's gone back to his work as a farmer. So the take home message for this type of fractures is, we must not forget the sustenticulum, which is an important part of the weight wearing subtalar joint. 
If it's depressed or it's displaced, it alters the mechanics of the subtalar joint, which leads to late osteoarthritis. And then you have so many problems which are often misdiagnosed in the early phases. Now, sometimes these fragments are large enough to even need a plate, especially when they're large and they have comminution. And it's relatively simple to approach it from the medial side and fix it. So uh, I just would advise that we don't miss the diagnose, diagnosis and be aggressive in our management protocols. There's an anterior end calcaneus fractures, which could involve the calcaneo cuboid joint, but it may not involve the subtalar joint. It's not true, but there's a great chance it may not involve the subtalar joint. The small avulsion fragments are different from these crushed injuries. Now, this lady fell off a motor scooter and she had a crushed anterior end of the calcaneus. You can see this over happening here. Plus, there is a midfoot dislocation as well as a subtalar subluxation. So, this is the whole complex around the talus with a fracture in the anterior end of the calcaneus, which is the problem. So, here you got to focus on both the fractures as well as the dislocations. So this anterior end of the calcaneus, which was open, needs care about the wound. You've got to reduce the midfoot and subtalar joints, and you've got to get the calcaneus out to length to maintain the lateral column length. So it's not a simple job to you. So what we do over here, we went in through the wound, we reduced the subtalar joint, we distracted it using an indigenous Indian fixator, which we call a jess frame, and for the lateral column, what I took was <clears throat> I took a corticocancellous bone graft and inserted it behind the articular surface of the calcaneus to reform the calcaneo cuboid joint. And because it was open, we fixed it with two K wires. And over a period of time, she's done well. You can see that the bone has reconstituted, the calcaneo cuboid and subtalar joints are fine, and she's gone back to her job as a primary school teacher, and she's quite happy. So you've got to get the biomechanics of the foot right. So if, if you have an anterior end of the calcaneus fracture, remember it's different from the standard DIACF. It's got lots of crushing, which shortens the lateral column of the foot. May be nothing wrong with the subtalar joint, but you've got to understand the mechanics of the injury and the mechanics of the reconstruction to get foot column restoration. What about the back? We have these avulsed calcaneus tuberosity. They're more common than the interior end of the calcaneus fractures. And this 32 year old male presented with an avulsed tuberosity fracture. He came to the outpatients and here, we have to have a different management. We have to have a totally different thought process because the reason is this has to be treated as a surgical emergency. This avulsed fragment will cut through from the skin behind because it's been pulled up by the tendoaculus and you would have serious problems in the skin at the back. So one of our senior residents fixed this in the middle of the night following the correct principles of surgical emergency fixation. They fixed it with screws, but you must realize that this is not enough because the screws, if you notice here, are short. They are not holding on the other side. This screw is short and that's what happened. Within four weeks, these screws pull through. And what we were trying to prevent on day one, that is breakdown of the skin at the back, happens. So you must remember, if you're doing an emergency fixation of the avulsed calcaneus, it has to be done with something strong. And again, in our book, there's a, there's a chapter which talks about it because there's a high failure rate of screws enough alone. This fracture is seen in older people who could have osteopenia. And because the screws don't have enough grip, the tendoaculis could pull it out. So there are other methods which you could use. One of the things which we've talked about in our book is take a locked plate and bend it at 90 degrees and supplement the screws with the locked plate. Or you can add tension band wiring. Like this example, which I'm going to show a 19 year old female who came with an open fracture. But you see over here, the skin is already broken down and the calcaneus is not so much pulled off. It's not a pull off fracture, rather a crushed fracture. Nevertheless, 
the stability which you need is the same so here what was done was it was debrided the wound was closed and tension band wire over uh, over two longitudinal wires and a screw was added and a patient was put in a pop slab in about 5 degrees of equinus this we hope holds and this held and that's why the soft tissues don't break down so the take home message for the avulsed tuberosities is you need to do an open reduction even in closed injuries. You're going to do it in open injuries anyway because you need to prevent the soft tissue breakdown. Screws alone are not enough. They don't hold. They cannot withstand the strain of the pull of the tendoachillus. So you have to supplement it. You can supplement it with a plate which is bent or a lateral sided tension band wire. Now we come to the, the main, main bone. Everybody wants to talk about this. This is like Humpty Dumpty breaking down. And this is the hottest topic of discussion. The simplest classification even today is a tongue type fracture or a joint depression fracture. But there can be many significant variations. This example of a bilateral calcaneus fracture of the central type, one side open, the other closed, but the fracture pattern and the degree of comminution in both is very, very different. So here you have to understand and classify this according to the Sanders classification. So what you do is you must understand that Sanders has a classification of three to four types based on the degree of comminution and the location of the fracture line. So many of them look innocuous and could, yes, I agree, could be treated non-operatively, but you have to select the proper case. This relatively undisplaced 50 year old person was put in a plaster. You can see the CT scan, not so displaced, not so much lateral wall blowout, not so much virus. You could treat it, but the patient has to listen to you. This guy started walking and within three months, the tuberosity depressed, the lateral wall got pushed out and this patient presents to you with subtalar arthritis. So in a non-operative treatment, you have to select the patient and you have to make sure that the patient is compliant. Otherwise, non-operative treatment will fail. So the controversy today is not surgery or non-operative treatment. Most people agree that the intra-articular calcaneus fracture, which is broken like an egg, needs to be stabilized. The controversy is extensile approach or minimally invasive surgery. And let's look into that a bit. If you look at the Sanders classification, the undisplaced fractures and the ones which are seriously comminuted, the, there's no controversy. You have to treat them with one extreme or the other, and that's a different thing. The problems or the debates, whether you have to do a MIS or you have to do an extensile approach, is in the Sanders 2 and the Sanders 3. Now, the extensile approach, which I started doing in 1993, is a good procedure. I learned it from Dr. Leung, who published in the JBJS in Hong Kong. And I have now learned over time that many factors influence the outcomes. The most important factor is two things. One is select the case with care and the select the surgeon with care. If the surgeon is not comfortable in doing this, you will end up with a botched job. If the case is not right, you can, you have diabetes, you have an old guy, you have bad skin, you will end up with a botched job. So let's look at it. And that's because of that, many, many things have changed into the so-called MIS. It's the vogue thing of the 21st centuries. And MIS are many methods which have used different techniques and different methods of fixation. So I'll take you through in the next five, seven minutes into what I mean with this. Now, this is a bilateral fracture. I think we've seen many bilateral fractures. One side was a wound. So we did multiple K wires and an X fix. On the other side, it was closed. We did an open reduction internal fixation with a locking plate. And over time, you can see that you got good reconstitution of the joint and of the heel, and the function is good on both sides. So it depends. If you choose your case well and do the procedure well, you could get good outcomes with both procedures. And we've been publishing this since the last about 10 years. And we are also now saying that if you can do an MIS, maybe MIS is better. Now, 
What about the MIS techniques? Silent starts our approach when we started doing it, we used to put wires and a couple of screws. But now we are all comfortable in even plating the calcaneus with special plates using the sinus star psi approach. The outcomes are as good as the extensile approach. Now this was a doctor who came to us during the COVID period, about a year now, fell from the height. His wife's a gynecologist in our institute and they came to us with this kind of fracture. Just look at this fracture. It's a, it's a Sanders 3. If you look at the CT scan, you will see very clearly. It's a, you've got a lateral and a medial fracture line which goes obliquely. There's a small cystenticulum fragment at one side, but a big fragment at the other side. The same you can see in the sagittal views. So this is a case which is a tuberosity type of fracture, which has got some degree of comminution in the center. Now the plan is fixation by MIS. Which method you want to use for MIS is perhaps up to your experience. Now surgical planning is the key. If you want to do MIS, you have to have everything right in your mind about what you want to do. You have to understand the fracture pattern and how you will reduce it. So the key point here is to get this tongue shaped fragment back, you have to create space for it to go back. And therefore you have to pull the tuberosity down. You have to rotate this and then push it back on the subtalar joint. And then you can stabilize it with whatever method you like. For example, this case, an open fracture, you can just simply stabilize it with K-wires or add an external fixator, especially if it's an open injury, and you'll get a good outcome. Now, the this case, it's a different case from the doctor I showed you. We haven't done its treatment as yet, but this is something I did 10 years ago. Similar case, displaced tuberosity, minimal varus, and we did it by a percutaneous method, no sinus star side. We were able to manipulate all the fragments back and fixed it with multiple K wires. Did good. So today we do it differently because we would like the accuracy of reduction of this part, the subtalar part and some degree of compression to minimize the pressure of the lateral wall on the peroneal tendons. So we come back to a similar looking case, which we did in November last year. The surgical plan is indirect elevation of the joint fragment, stabilize the reduction and plate it to maintain the Gisane angle because this can go wrong despite the fact that the bowler angle looks good. So this is the sinus star psi approach. You can see the fracture and you can identify the step over here, but you have to clear the lateral wall here by lifting off the peroneal tendons. And then you do an indirect reduction with steam and pins. You'll be able to get it there. You have to get the tuberosity out of varus, and then you can slide a plate under the peroneal tendons, gradually fix it in place, and you will get a good outcome. You can get both the bowlers and Gisane angles restored, as well as the medial wall restored, and you will always be able to ensure that you get as good an outcome as an extensile approach. So the MIS, well done, is a good method. Now, if you have a depressed fragment and you can't manipulate it from behind by the Steenman pin, this is a fragment lying all alone. You can manipulate it by using both the Steenman pin to clear the space and elevate it with a periosteal reaction, uh, elevator or by a so-called osteotope. And then you fix it with screws from lateral to medial side and the rest of the joints, you can fix it with, uh, with multiple wires. In 2012, we used to cross the joint to into the tailors and into the cuboid, which we don't do anymore now, but we come more experienced with the sinus star psi approach. We've got multiple publications, and now we've realized that you are able to do almost everything by MIS, what you needed to do by the open extensile approach. Although I still do that in some of the cases where I think it is indicated. Now the last talk, which many people are not aware of, and which is perhaps the biggest challenge, is a calcaneus fracture dislocation. When I give, give this talk at many places, people say, what the hell is a calcaneus fracture dislocation? Well, it is an entity which looks innocuous. Look at these three cases, which we've seen in the last two years. The calcaneus hair looks depressed, hair looks not so bad, hair looks fine. The bowler angle doesn't look too bad at all, but there are problems over here. What happens here is that the whole calcaneus goes out underneath the fibula 
and only a small sustentaculum fragment is left behind. So you don't get a depressed facet, you get a shifted bone and people don't realize it and don't pick it up. And I am, I have treated about seven cases who come to me with a neglected calcaneus fracture dislocation, which we are planning to publish uh, in the next few months. Now, this is also a chapter in the EO manual, which I am a co-author of. So the key point here is the dislocated calcaneus is lying abutted against the fibula laterally and you could get some crushing of the fibula of the peroneal tendons etc so the approach here has to be different this is a young male with a complex injury you can see that the bowler angle doesn't look too bad but the whole calcaneus is underneath the fibula so what do you want to do you want to go in there and you have to identify it and bring it back so here you have to have a modified approach. The sinus tarsi approach, we extend proximally, however much we want to do, so that you can pull the peroneal tendons down, make sure you don't injure the, the peroneal nerve or the, the distal part of the nerve or the sural nerve, just make sure of that. And when you open it, you can see that the top of the facet is lying underneath the fibula over here. So now you got to manipulate it. You have a significant difficulty in reduction you put a steaming pin you put an osteotome lever it without causing damage underneath the talus and when you leave it lever it underneath the talus you will find that with your temporary reduction i put in k wires there is a void in the lateral column because the calcaneo cuboid joint was also injured but that's not enough you have to go medially and through a sustenticular approach you fix the sustenticulum to the main body of the calcaneus the calcaneus is in place and you fix this sustentaculum back to it, fix it with screws from the medial side and the plating has to be on the lateral column, not on the calcaneus. We've got the calcaneus in place, held in place by the screws from the sustentaculum and then you have to plate the lateral column to get it out onto length and the external fixator is acting like a distractor. You take it out and the plate after being applied differently will give you a normal looking heel and a subtalar joint. So the take home message is, this is something we need to recognize. It's not so common, about less than 1% of major injuries. The methods of treatment are different. The foot column lengths need to be maintained and you need two and sometimes three incisions. So ladies and gentlemen, what have I learned? This is my learning with Tim Skeffers and Stefan Remelt and what I've learned from Joe Schatzker over my years in EO is that and of course while we were writing the AO trauma manual we used to meet every every three months sometimes in the cold but it was good fun when we wrote it is that there can be a great variety of calcaneus fractures what can happen is you may not understand them the peripheral fractures are different the management options are different the central fractures which we all know where there's this debate about not operating extensile and mis basically if they are displaced like any articular fractures of the tibia of the hip or wherever need an accurate reduction of the depressed facet you need to reconstitute both the bowler and gisane angles to get the hind foot mechanics back in place and of course the trends are towards minimally invasive methods but the combination of methods are also good so you have, sometimes you can do a mis with a little incision here and there you should aim for getting an accurate reduction and a good stabilization. Even in 2021, 15 to 20% 20 of my cases are done with an extensile approach, especially if they come to me at seven, eight, 10 days when MIS becomes an issue and the skin has healed, the soft tissues have healed. So sometimes you have to think outside the box. In complex cases, you have to reconstruct the fracture in your mind before you attempt any surgical reconstruction. I thank you so much for your time and I am, I am ready for any questions if you may have. Thank you so much, sir. I request uh, double the size, sir. So for any questions or comments, sir, from your side. Mandeep, sir, that's an excellent uh, talk to hear on a Sunday afternoon. That's a complete review of calcaneal fractures. Um, just one question is, how often do you see patients for fusions uh, in, in delayed cases or in neglected cases in your practice? 
uh, Dhawal, you know, when I was youngster, I used to have a lot of arguments about calcaneus fractures with Dr. Kanabar from Ahmedabad, Dr. Kulkarni from there, you know, and uh, they, I, they used to say nobody w wants a, a calcaneus fracture, post-calcaneus fracture fusion. And I tended to agree with them. The Indians have a lot of adaptability, you see, but when the lateral wall starts hurting, and the subtalar arthritis becomes significant and they can't walk on uneven ground, they come to you. So there's about 30% of these malunions which are not so severe, no, no varus, nothing, they go down. But now, maybe because I am a referral center, I am seeing three subtalar fusions a week. Oh. But you I see. am also seeing 12 uh, to 20 calcaneous fractures a month. So not only are we managing them, we are also seeing referrals for sub fusion and we are doing some of them. We are doing about two to three a week. One of the other very interesting things, I think with your passion for and teaching this subject is, I think the concept of MIS is spreading far and wide. You know? I mean, we are hearing youngsters uh, doing this technique, showing results. So that's another, another happier thing to, to know and see. So, it, it, it's been very good. I think this subspeciality of, of foot and ankle fractures is spreading. I think all, all thanks to your efforts um, that, that's been around. Any, any um, uh, what about soft tissue reconstructions uh, challenges that you see in your center because of? Yeah, um, you know, I have an unusually higher uh, incidence of open calcaneous fractures. Every third calcaneous fracture I'm seeing is an open fracture for the simple reason we are a referral center and we have a plastic surgery team with us. And, uh, you know, if you go into, we published on open calcaneous fractures also and we, uh, we've collected our data also. They are not so bad. So if you've got an open cal calcaneous fracture, depends upon what it is. If it is an inside out opening, the wound is usually medial. You can do what you want. But if it's a runover or a crushing, then you've got all those kinds of scenarios. And then that's when I meant the combination of therapy comes into place. You put the pieces together like Humpty Dumpty, and then you can offload with external fixators. With the so-called understanding that I may need to go in for the second time early, or I could even go in if I've got the whole box fairly in a nice position at six months to one year if they have symptoms. So we try to put it all back in whatever way we can. And depend if there's an elderly patient with a paraplegia or you know severe polytrauma, then these cases get neglected, the, the close fractures, the bilateral injuries. So if you have a unilateral guy with an amputation on the other side, this heel has to be reconstituted. It's an important, it's an important heel. So Absolutely. so many things come into play. One is what's the patient profile? What's the need of the hour? What's the fracture type? And what is the experience? Now at our centers, we've got three consultants who can do calcaneous fractures better than me. They've learned over the last 20 years and they don't let me come to the OR so many times. So that's a problem. I'm, <laughs> I'm probably forgetting what to do. But the issue is then people see this and then they try and reproduce. I've got pictures of percutaneous attempted calcaneous in C2K wires of a displaced fracture. Now that is where things go on. That, as in the O conferences, you talk of open internal fixation, no reduction in all one. Whereas the key point is reduction of the subtalar joint, getting the hip tuberosity out of wearers, getting it down, and reconstituting hind foot mechanics. One of the things which I haven't talked about and which is often debated because I had this debate with Mark Myerson many, many years ago, is in comminuted fractures, primary fusion. I am not an advocate of that. I get asked this question many times. For the simple reason, it's very difficult to do. Secondly, you get a higher complication rate. And thirdly, if I just do a little bit of MIS with wires, 40 to 50% of them will not want a second surgery. Second surgery. Go to a primary fusion. People ask me, why not? Thank you. Thank you. And, and lastly, is, is there any role of arthroscopy in calcaneal fractures yes. surgery? We often do an open arthroscopy, you know, especially when you've got the far medial uh, fracture, which you are not so sure reduce. We were taught when I went to Dr. Liu and everybody is with Sir Melton and all, that you can feel the top of the calcaneus with the periosteum elevator. 
But if you've got an arthroscope, you just put it in without the fluid. You do an open arthroscopy. That's very, very helpful. You just have to see whether you got the top of the subtalar joint reconstituted or not. It's a helpful tool. Thank you so much, Mandeep. I think that's a whole encyclopedia on calcaneal fractures. Ah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Dillon. That was a fascinating speech. Thank you. Uh, I would ask, how would you manage a calcaneal malignion? Do you add a reconstructive bulbous or various osteotomy uh, or just prefer fusion, subtalar fusion? If I continue the next 20 slides of my talk, it's all about calcaneus malignion. I cut it short, but you do. We, we de it depends upon the type of malunion. If, you know, we, we classify the malunions of three types. If they don't have too much hind foot deformity, just a lateral wall bulge, then we just shave off that lateral wall. That's the type one malunion. If they've got subtalar arthritis with the lateral wall bulge, then you have to shave off this. I use this as a graft and do a subtalar distraction arthrodesis. I have to sort of open up the joint to get the heel back for proper biomechanics. But unfortunately, many times we get a type 3 malunion, which also has a significant varus of the heel. So we can either do a lateral closing wedge osteotomy or a slide osteotomy to get it right. So we get the heel height back and you correct the uh, uh, varus of the heel. So that works. That, has, that is required in about 15 to 20% of my cases. But a large majority of them require just a lateral wall excision to minimize the peroneal tendon impingement and a distraction of the back to get the heel height into position to minimize anterior ankle pain. And how do you decide whom to, um, whom to apply uh, sliding osteotomy, whom to apply uh, wedge osteotomy? Ha, that's a tough question. So if we, it's often difficult for us to do that because when I do a wedge osteotomy, I shorten the heel height a bit. So that's an issue. So if I do not have too much of a deformity or a shape, then you often have to just do a simple slide. So we often end up with doing more wedges than slides. The slide which people do for, you know, flat foot, they do a medial slide. It's just the reverse of that. You've got to get into a lateral slide. So we often end up because of the deformed calcaneus doing a little bit of a wedge correction, taking out this wedge, which again helps us as graft in the subtalar joint, and then fixing the uh, three bones together, the distal calcaneus, the subtalar joint calcaneus, and the talus. Okay. Uh, I think that's really been quite a good uh, discussion. And uh, before uh, we allow Sir to sign off, since he has uh, some other commitment, one, uh, Strange question from me, sir. Do they need any specialized footwear after uh, uh, these kind of fractures that are treated? Well, I, we keep them non-weight bearing. Even if they are operated, we keep them non-weight bearing. And then you see the, there's a the difference. If you put them in a plaster cast, even if you're doing non-operative, they tend to get CRPS or they tend to lose. So we like to have them in a splint or a slab so that they do not develop an equinus contracture. That is one. But we would like them to be mobile because by the fourth or fifth day, if you don't have problems with the wound, one of the reasons why we don't mobilize is the extensile approach. You're worried about the wound breakdown. So if you don't have problems with the wound, we do both subtalar mobilizations as well as ankle range of motion exercises, but no weight bearing. Weight bearing is deferred to, in my practice, never before depending upon the degree of combination, how much, what is the fracture type, not before uh, uh, about two months to three months. And then also we put them in a walking boot. And by about three to five months, they are walking normally. Unless they've had a flattening of the arch because of the calcaneus going down drastically, we really don't need anything more than a soft insert inside the heel. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, it's been very enlightening, both the talks, both in different directions, but a uh, lot of lot of clinical uh, takeaways from both the talks. And let's go on to the third talk, Chasna. Uh, yeah, ma'am. So we request Vidisha Kulkani, ma'am, to please share her slides and uh, take us through her journey of MIPO in fracture humerus. Mm. 
Are you able to see? Yeah, ma'am, it's sharing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, full screen, ma'am, and yeah. So full screen is see. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So after very nice elaborative talk on calcaneal fractures by Mandeep sir. and a very uh, new topic learned today from rusha madam my talk is relatively simple first of all i thank our convener rujuta who is the most dynamic orthopedic leader from women's wing and i also thank the most efficient chasnal who is co convener so today i am sharing my journey of minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis for humerus fractures which started in 2008 so this is published in injury journal 2017 so as we know there are problems associated with rigid fixation like uh, delayed union or non union osteoporosis underneath the plate stress fracture at the ends refracture after implantary mole and because of extensive dissection uh increasing incidence of infection there came need of biological fixation so initially it was in the form of nailing for humerus in the last century so initially i was a nailer from 1997 till 2013 and uh, later on in uh, the second decade when the minimally invasive placed osteosynthesis became popular for lower limb fractures especially the femur and tibia with very good results this uh, started in humerus as well there were problems associated with nailing although it is a very good technique indeed but it does not tolerate distraction at fracture site so there is more incidence of non union because of distraction at an elderly patient A rotator cuff disc function i will show a case uh, this young boy who presented with compound grade 1 uh, trauma to right humerus which was nailed and the x ray was apparently good but in subsequent follow ups and at one year it failed to unite and there was pain so the revision was performed with compression plating and bone grafting and ultimately it united so definitely minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis has advantages over nailing it also offers biological fixation there is soft tissue preservation no grafting is required and plate can be applied in anatomically safe area fracture site is not open at all the plate bridges achieves indirect reduction at the fracture site by fixing the uh, fragments away from the fracture site so it offers a flexible fixation and gives relative st relative stability this can be bridged even in simple transverse fractures the advantage is that with long plate stresses are distributed evenly over a larger section of the bone so in 2008 i saw this patient comminuted segmental fracture extending into either metaphysis uh, the proximal metaphysis and uh, at that time uh, the long phyllos plate was not commonly available it was made to order and since this was our first case the plate was applied on the lat lateral aspect of the distal humerus so i do agree that uh, though although proximally it is a delto pectoral approach distally it is the lateral approach so it needs a lot of dissection in the area of the radial nerve in order to protect the nerve and slide the plate underneath the nerve so this fracture united the patient regained movement but for subsequent cases uh, the approach was different proximally it was chosen deltoid split approach for this patient and the uh, distal for the plating anterior approach was selected by twisting the long phyllos plate this is how the plate is twisted with the ao device so that proximally it lies in the posterolateral area 
and distally it comes to lie in on the anterior surface of the humerus so this is how uh, this plate was applied uh, proximally through deltoid split by exploring the axillary nerve and sliding the plate underneath the nerve and distally it was twisted in the area of deltoid tuberosity so it lies on the anterior surface of the humerus this is how it united and the patient regained his functional shoulder and elbow arc uh, this is another case done in 2013 with a a uh, comminuted shaft fracture with a spike uh, again this was done with a delto delto pectoral approach proximally the plate was twist twisted and distally it is the anterior approach so through this approach axillary nerve dissection is avoided in the proximal area and radial nerve dissection is avoided in the distal area and this is how the plate uh, is applied as this was the uh, very uh, one of very my initial cases at 3 months uh, there was a, a big gap around the fragment so i did a cortico cancellus bone grafting this is the only case of bone grafting in my series and ultimately the fracture united so coming to next case this can be done in compound fractures after proper debridement and soft tissue cover so this is a segmental fracture extending into the proximal humerus this is the ct there is vertical fracture of the tuberosity as well so after debridement again the long phyllos twisted plate was used uh, again proximally delto pectoral approach and distally anterior surface of the humerus and the bid removal was done around 3 to 4 weeks and this is how the fracture united and there was good functional recovery of the shoulder and elbow function so now coming to polytrauma patient uh, associated with upper trunk brachial flexus palsy as well as uh, radial nerve dysfunction there was some anterior deltoid loss a distal femur fracture patella fracture and acromion fracture associated on the left side so this is the ct picture grossly unstable shoulder with so much comminution distal to the surgical neck again a long phyllos plate was selected uh, the acromion was fixed with k wires and the shoulder temporarily stabilized with k wires across the glenoid uh, which were removed at 3 weeks and the surgery was done in stages stage 1 debridement and fixation of the humerus with long uh, uh, twisted phyllos plate and uh, skin grafting for the skin de defect anteriorly and in the second stage oberlin procedure was performed to regain elbow uh, function which was done at around 3 months and the in third stage at around 6 to 7 months the tendon transfer for radial nerve uh, was done so eventually Uh, this uh, shoulder became stable and this went to union in around 8 to 9 it took 8 to 9 months for complete union this is one year follow up of the same patient and this is he has reasonable forward flexion and abduction and good elbow flexion and uh, wrist and hand function the patient was happy although uh the uh, abduction of forward flexion was terminally restricted beyond 100 degrees the patient was happy so coming to technique after 2013 i started routinely doing uh, mipo for humerus fractures and uh, this technique has now replaced the uh, nailing in our institute so the patient is placed supine with an uh, arm board underneath the humerus two incisions are taken one proximal and one distal distal incision centering over the tendon of biceps around 3 to 4 cm in length it is important to measure the length of the plate under image intensive fire um, by giving slight uh, traction and aligning the fracture 
then the uh, biceps uh, muscle is retracted medially and the musculocutaneous nerve is visualized so the brachialis is split in the center of the uh, muscle belly so this becomes the internervous plane between the radial and the musculocutaneous nerve the proximal incision is over the deltopectoral interval so cephalic vein is identified and retracted laterally then long head of biceps is retracted medially it is important to check before sliding the plate that that no muscle should be un interposed underneath the plate so uh, nowadays i am uh, directly sliding the plate below upwards this can be done vice versa above downwards a tunnel is created from the brachialis interval uh, over the anterior surface of the humerus so that the plate exits proximally through deltopectoral interval and the plate should be centralized over each fragment and this can be checked under image intensifier it is very very important to centralize the plate so yes. that the screws uh, goes exactly in the center this can be done a small k wire can be used to anchor the plate to the bone on uh, in each fragment there is a hole provided uh, at the last uh, screw entry so this is how the uh, plate is anchored to the bone fracture is aligned by giving a longitudinal slight traction to the elbow and giving lateral thrust at the fracture site with another hand and then a cortical screw is inserted in one fragment in case of transverse fracture no distraction should be kept the reduction should be checked before tightening of the screw and after tightening of the cortical screw the k wire can be removed before it enters the second cortex otherwise there is a chance of breaking of the k wire so once the reduction is checked the other cortical screw is put in uh, proximal fragment this can be done vice versa after tightening of both the cortical screws again it is checked under image intensive fire and if it is satisfactory both locking screws are put two to three screws can be put in each fragment uh, if the fracture is too distal or proximal one of the screw can be removed A cortical screw can be removed um, at the end to increase the working length so this is done with a free hand technique this can also be done uh, nail assisted or fixator assisted but i prefer this technique a very good assistance is required for this technique to hold the elbow as well as to give lateral uh, uh, reduction by giving pressure over the fracture site so coming to cases so oblique fracture a two type of fracture fixed with this technique united so th uh, there are people who uh, do nail assisted plating but i find it difficult to pass screw cortical screw in the center with the nail inside so i am not using this technique anymore but i have done a few cases of fixed or assisted plating the problem with this is that the both the pins should be passed to the same plane uh, the shunt pins are put at the end proximal pin through the greater tuberosity or just below it and distal pin through the lateral epicondyle or through the lateral condyle but it is important that the both the fragments should be in the same rotation or neutral rotation so that the with uh, when the bar is connected the plate should be slided easily and it should lie on the anterior surface of the humerus so these are a few intraoperative pictures of fixator assisted plating but nowadays i have shifted from fixator assisted to free hand technique which i demonstrated in the last video so b2 type of fracture fixed with this technique united with good shoulder and elbow function in all patients a three type of fracture even transverse fractures can be bridged by this technique 
care is taken to avoid distraction uh, while tightening the cortical screw in one fragment. So this seals by callus. C3 type of fracture. For C3 type of fracture, this is really a good technique. Uh, it may take some six to eight months to achieve full union. Uh, this is the function. Again, uh, A3 type of fracture is, you see in this X-ray, the plate is sitting eccentrically and there is some angulation at the fracture site. Even then the fracture has united. So it is important while uh, uh, checking under an image to uh, centralize the plate over both the fragments to avoid this problem. When the screws go through the cortex, sometimes there is a risk of fracturing uh, through screw hole if uh, it is uh, drilled multiply through the same screw while putting uh, cortical screw. So this is just to show that a two screw purchase can lead to union even though the plate is sitting eccentrically. So uh, for compound fractures, I had two cases of infection. So that needed early implant removal at around one year after union was achieved. I do not recommend uh, use of this technique in compound fracture unless the wound is non-contaminated and there is good muscle and uh, good skin cover. There is a single case of non-union in my series, B2 type of fracture. This is the picture at the end of one year. Uh, so it was plated, revision plating was performed and bone grafting was performed at one and a half year. So this ultimately united and he achieved good function. So now coming to this kind of comminuted segmental fracture uh, in which I'm sharing my experience because the instead of a plate going on the anterior surface because of the combination, it slided posteriorly. And there was difficulty in reinserting the plate and the patient developed radial nerve palsy Fortunately, uh, this is the immediate post-op uh, X-ray and subsequent follow-ups. This united well, and fortunately, he regained his uh, nerve by around five months post-operatively. And this is his video. This is two-year follow-up. Again, uh, coming to a patient who demanded implant removal, there, uh, this question is frequently asked, uh, is implant removal difficult with this technique? So I do not recommend uh, implant removal for each and every patient. Those who demand uh, implant removal, I do it. So implant removal can be done uh, with uh, two incisions only by slightly enlarging the incision and creating, recreating the tunnel for uh, uh, pass, sliding the plate for implant removal. So this can be done uh, with the two incision technique only. So in my series, which has crossed now 80 cases, there were 74 closed injuries, six open injuries, five polytrauma patients and six floating elbows. In few patients, long phyllos plate was inserted and uh, the plate, uh, 10 to 14 hole plate was used, locking plate. Uh, mean follow-up was up to six and a half months and longest in one patient of 12 years. There were two brachial flexus injuries associated and seven pre-op radial nerve palsies of which all the nerves recurred except one. There is a single case of non-union in this series, a single case of bone grafting, which was actually not essential. It was my first case. And infection in uh, two patients, which were compound fractures. The average union time was six months, uh, ranging in between three to eight months. Full range of motion in all patients, uh, shoulder and elbow function was good. There is a single case of postoperative radial nerve palsy, which recurred in five months. And all preoperative radial nerve palsies recurred except in one patient which had segmental nerve loss and the ends were not pressable. So in conclusion, uh, minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis is effective modality 
for closed humeral shaft fractures it is good for comminuted fractures which are extending proximally and uh, distally even complex humeral shaft fractures can be treated with this technique without exploring the radial nerve or axillary nerve it is important to avoid distraction when it is uh, applied in transverse fractures thank you for patient listening thank you dr kukane it was lovely speech and you have excellent results, uh, which really requires some ex experience, not some, lot experience. So I would like to ask to what extent do you think the uh, same excellent results can be repeated? Uh, uh, what is the learning cur curve of this uh, procedure? How many cases do you think? You know? yeah, I have done up to 80 cases till now. And initially, the time taken for surgery was a bit longer, three to four hours in some cases. In one case, I had to open OR, do ORIF after struggling for two hours. But last now, uh, six to seven years, I'm doing this in uh, two and a half hours, two to two and a half hours with this freehand technique. And it is... Uh, good alternative to humerus interlock kneeling, I feel. Yes. Uh -huh. Vidisha, ma'am, good evening. Good evening, sir. Yeah, so very interesting two sets of, uh, you know, solutions you have shown in this. Um, my question, one first question was the, the twisted plate. Um, yeah. Why do you not just carry on along the anterior lateral surface instead of twisting it anteriorly? What is the what is the logic on that? Oh. Because the reason I'm asking is you can get a better length to length reduction if you have two screws at both ends and attraction. Whereas with this, because your forces are working in different direction, if you see in your uh, X rays, the comminuted fragments uh, length. Uh, might be you know a little difficult to achieve so just wondering i'm just seeing those are very excellent results but i'm just asking you yeah this was done in order to avoid dissection of the radial nerve on lateral side because it it then it becomes uh, not minimally invasive if you dissect radial nerve and uh, slide the plate underneath the uh, as it curves lat around uh, lateral intramuscular septum and that you need to struggle to slide your plate down with but this would it, would it make a difference right so but would it make a difference if this plate distally was on the lateral surface that's one question it definitely uh, yeah it would have uh, be uh, been uh, alignment would have been better uh, my cases have united in slight angulation because of this twisting and uh, uh, longer time for union maybe my first case was applied on the lateral surface. So after that experience, I shifted it to anterior surface and I find it easy to apply anteriorly because there is no so, neurological structure in that area. My new ma'am, if I have a choice now, I will do an anterior bridge plate only for a humeral shaft. I will not open and do it. I agree with you completely. Um, what about simpler fractures? So A-type fractures, are you like, everybody would say A-type fractures, humerus, compress. But I think for the humerus, bridge plate with a reasonable reduction works works well. I mean, is that your experience? Yeah, I have done it for uh, A1, A2, A3, all type of fractures. Last six, seven years, I'm doing this technique only. So nailing okay. uh, is almost stopped for last six years. The, the other technical experience which I have seen is what is called as the uh, bowstring effect. So if, if you have a longer plate and a longer segment, sometimes the, the, the middle fragment or the proximal fragment tends to lend away because it's like a bow and arrow. So is there yeah. any tips to avoid or, you know, avoid that? I, I take a long time. Uh, I focus mainly on centralizing the plate in both the fragments. Perfect, so one, yes. person is, one person is holding reduction in the lateral coronal plane. So he is giving pressure, lateral pressure, so that there is a, a, the translation is minimized and the cortical screw pulls the bone towards the plate. So anterior, posterior uh, translation is also taken care. 
and if the uh, k wire anchors the plate the small k wire helps a lot because it holds the plate in the center at the lower end so you can put additional wire so the additional wire in the third hole so that your cortical screw should exactly go in the center of the third hole so that helps me in align aligning the fragments in the proper way and what about the standard controversies of two screws versus three screws and lock versus non lock screws so i am routinely using a cortical screw in the third hole and okay. uh, two locking screws uh, uh, in the proximal end and distal end if the were i find working length if it is small then i remove the conventional screws and keep two screws in each fragment at the end of the procedure initially i apply three screws on both the sides but i, I there think it doesn't enough, enough length yeah enough to stick up I think three or two doesn't make a difference, but I mean there are there yeah. are some people who swear by two screws on there. No, these are very excellent cases. Thank you. Any 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 how so initially how often initially did you have to change to an open reduction? Ah, uh, in uh, two cases I did. After struggling okay. for two and half hours, I shifted to ORF, oh. and in sure. one case because of multiple drilling, there was a fracture through the screw hole. so i okay. removed that plate okay. and applied a longer plate so two cases i did orf but as you said very rightly the key is the centralization of the plate in the distal fragment because it's it's an apex it's not a flat surface so yeah. if you don't like the showed in that case it wavers off so i think that that's very important yeah sure and is there any recommendation for the length of the plate for say standard shaft fracture like 10 hole 12 hole or uh, You for measure. adult patients usually uh, adult patients need 12 to 13 hole plates if the bone is longer you can use 14 hole if the height is smaller then you can you may use 11 hole and do you recommend a narrow or a broad dcp in in, in this case as a uh, choice this like is a routine 4.5 plate you no, no but there's a broad and a narrow so you use a narrow dcp like in this so this is a narrow one okay okay sure Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And I would ask: if, if, Do you think that uh, radial nerve damage can occur during the manipulation or screwing plate? Uh, uh, placement. It is possible. It is possible if the spike uh, hits the nerve during reduction, uh, but uh, not because of the plate. Because see, while applying the plate, it is lying exactly on the anterior surface. We put homan on medial side, not on the lateral side, and the, all the muscles are retracted away from the plate. So, not because of the plate, but maybe because of the fracture spike. This may happen. This may happen, but if the nerve is intact, it will recover, unless it is lacerated. So, more, very often in close fractures, the nerve is intact. and through the distal uh, incision you can uh, explore the radial nerve as well because it lies in between the brachialis and brachioradialis and uh, the incision is very nearby so if you want you can explore the nerve through the same distal incision just to so check I'm... intactness of the nerve yeah so as far as i understand you use mipotis uh, technique uh, with post traumatic radial nerve injury cases also right yeah Thank you. That was excellent speech. Thank you. Vidisha, ma'am, it's a big pool of X-rays actually. So I was just wondering, uh, it's uh, just extension to um, Dr. Elena's uh, thing. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, if there is a uh, post-traumatic uh, radial nerve injury, does your surgical approach change, like from delta pectoral and anterior to do you shift to other approach, or it's the same? Uh, in i am talking about closed fractures more very often the nerves are intact it is very often it is neuropraxia and you need not explore the nerve so far i was doing nailing till 2013 uh, closed fractures associated with radial nerve pal palsy i never explored the nerve and i found complete nerve recovery within 3 to 5 months of uh, post operative so what the patient needs is uh, bracing the wrist 
in uh, extension intermittent exercise physiotherapy protocol and assurance so only compound injuries you need to explore the nor because nor laceration is commonly seen in uh, high velocity injuries so that way for such cases we do external fixators we never do nailing or uh, mipo technique for these cases so automatically the nor is explored do you give any immobilization post operatively and for how many days no no immobilization the very next day the physiotherapy begins uh, elbow flexion exercises as well as shoulder forward flexion and abduction exercises thank you i think it this this has really been a great great uh, uh, discussion there have been lots of thoughts exchanged a lot of variety right from trauma to calcaneum to uh, exotic topics in pediatric orthopedics and we've had a wonderful uh, relay amongst our chairman also uh, jamal despite of his happy problem in sudden emergency medical emergency he's back again that shows really really good commitment and uh, friendship and dhawal bhai who so nicely stood in and that's all we must learn from them that to just be there for each other when there is a sudden crisis uh brisha ma'am are you there with us um i would like to before i propose a vote of thanks i would like to have some uh, words of advice from you because you've been a role model and an icon to us when we grew up in pediatric orthopedics as to what voice should be doing further from here I think uh, you are doing a great job, Rujita. Far much more than I would have dared to do, and I think you are actually taking a lot of your time, and uh, not just taking your time, but I think you are spending a lot of time encouraging many young women. I think that's truly a mark of great leader. I'm hoping that you will go much far, far and further than how where you have reached. Now, I personally think that while we have been uh, doing a lot of um, um you know the general kind of stuff i think it's time for us to show what we are capable of and for that you need to now go the extra mile and encourage people to do research set up research things set up studies uh you know with hardly any effort at all but nabila and one more post graduate remember we did a small study with the voice both are published now okay so i think i mean that is a step you have to take further the data that you produce the data that they are producing to encourage them to publish it and to make a name for themselves so it's good to be saying that we are now a social force and we are uh, you know as good as you are but now it's time to show what we really are and which is we you know the women can work hard they can very very be very honest they can be very sincere and they can, they are quite intelligent and they are caring as well so the kind of studies that they are going to produce is going to be quite different from what we see in in general so i think i think you should now uh, focus on publications and research as well i think this is the bit that i feel is lacking i think you've done very well in all other areas it has been a real, a real uh, pleasure to have crafted this journey like uh, everything in life all good things have to come to an end so that there is a new beginning from here and with a lot of good advice from our seniors and lot and lot of good support from friends like jamal mandeep sir uh, dhawal bhai and uh, many other uh, members in ioa i think we will go from strength to strength i take this opportunity to thank ioa for this wonderful platform i take this opportunity to thank the yin and the yang both the men and the women who made a voice possible i take this opportunity to thank each and every member of voice remember each of us is just a drop in the ocean but together i think we become a very strong force so uh, thank you all for standing in there uh, i thank the audience for really going uh, you know all all out and supporting all five webinars i sincerely thank uh, people uh, who have stood behind us like a backbone i thank the waves council which is newly formed and they have really been like a great sisterhood to me emel anet tara erica tanya and uh, uh, of course uh, all all of you together and thanks for really making this a very successful series and last but not the least the closest to my heart 
my dear 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 chasnal who has been so so reliable throughout this whole journey and she's just made it complete possible for me and of course my dear ashok sham and neeraj bijlani for really putting this here into absolutely the forefront of academics and we promise to do more so with that with that and for the wonderful advice that all our seniors have given us and friends like uh, jamal who've been there we promise to harass you further jamal and we make sure that we will do more of academics and peer to peer mentorship that is my next plan and like madam said uh, producing data thank you all thank you bye Stop now, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you. It was my honor to be with you. Thank Hope you, everyone. Thank you so much. Much more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bye. See you in the IO. Thank you, Desai sir. Thank you. See you in the IO. Joining us. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. See you. Have a nice Sunday meeting. Yeah. Bye, ML. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye, ma'am. Bye, Rishama. Bye.